So thank you everyone for joining us. We are very excited to have Professor Philippa Yao talking about post-COVID capitalism and the power of creative distraction. After his talk, we'll have a short Q&A session. You can send your questions through the Q&A button or I can unmute you if you raise your hand and you can ask your question live. Uh, so moving on, we are very excited to have Professor Wendy Carling from the UCL Department of Economics, who has kindly accepted to give an introduction for our speaker. So without further ado, let's proceed with the introduction. Thank you very much, Ariana, and welcome, Philippe. Thanks so much uh, for inviting me. <laughs> so I first met Philippe in 1992 at a conference in Cambridge, Massachusetts about economic transformation of the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Um, in the years since, we've worked and written together on the economics of transition. Uh, in between academic positions at Harvard, Oxford, UCL, UCL, remember that, uh, LSE, uh, the Collège de France and INSEAD, Philippe was the EBRD, so the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development's chief economist. Um, and as an, as an aside, a failure to solve many of the problems we discussed about the economics of enterprise restructuring in the former Soviet Union resulted in stalled reforms and the economic and political basis for the current tensions between Russia and Ukraine. Um, in June last year, there was a four day online conference with more than 100 contributors, the best economists from around the world, including 11 Nobel Prize winners presenting research that was stimulated by the path-breaking Schumpeterian theory of economic growth uh, developed by Philippe and his co-author, Peter Howitt. Um, it was the 30 year anniversary of the publication of their seminal article. Uh, so the intensity of engagement with, with that topic last June uh, was really a testament to the revolution in economics that Philippe and, and Peter's work has stimulated I can say that I've never seen anything like it in my career as an economist. I've never seen this concentrated engagement with, uh, with such an important topic. Um, and as well as reporting a vast volume of research results and new evidence on the causes and consequences of innovation, this four day conference was peppered with new ideas to take the agenda forward. What shone through was the great science and the creative tension of collaboration really can work to change the world for the better. And uh, I welcome Philippe and urge you to listen to what he has to say. Well, thanks so much. Well, uh, Wendy, it's a very intimidating uh, introduction. I can only disappoint you now. <laughs> Beware the bump, <laughs> the downward bump. Okay, well, thanks so much for your very generous uh, words, uh, Wendy. And it's been uh, fantastic to I learned so much uh, collaborating with you and, and uh, you know, and, and reading your work and uh, in today's presentation will show it once more how much I owe you intellectually, Wendy, and, uh, and I will also never forget hence one day you came, you know, to work on something at EBRD with a guy and you could not see his face because he had long hair covering his face and you would open the you would open it like you open a curtain and it would be John von Rinen, you remember? <laughs> and I was John von Rinen young, uh, you know, in 92, no, 93. And I was, anyway. Okay, so, uh, um, so let me uh, share screen. Um, Slideshow, boom, boom, boom. Okay, so, uh, uh, so I, I, I call this Rethinking Capitalism Post-COVID, The Power of Creative Destruction. Uh, uh, it's based on, uh, uh, on, on our book, The Power of Creative Destruction, joined with Céline Antonin. Uh, Céline is a researcher at uh, Sciences Po and Collège de France with me. Simon Bunel is, uh, is a researcher at uh, Banque de France and Collège de France with me. And uh, voilà, here is uh, Schumpeter, a young age, I guess. And so creative destruction, it's a term coined by uh, Schumpeter to refer to the fact that new innovations displace all technologies. So creative destruction is this process whereby new innovations make all technologies become obsolete. For example, uh, uh, spelled out in uh, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy or other writings of, of Schumpeter. But there was no, when I did economics, when I studied economics, you know, uh, 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 there was no such thing as the Schumpeterian model of growth. It didn't exist. 
uh, and you didn't have any empirics uh, Schumpeter, of, of creative destruction either. Uh, so with Peter Howitt in 1987, we undertook to, uh, to build a model uh, uh, that would embody the notion of creative destruction. And uh, the model, which now you know, we refer to as the Schumpeter and Gauss paradigm, which has been uh, you know, developed and, and extended in many directions by uh, you know, young generation now, and uh, uh, revolves around three uh, main ideas. The first idea is that long-run growth is driven by a cumulative process of innovation, where each innovator bids, builds upon the, uh, you know, the giant shoulders uh, of her predecessors, of previous innovators. Uh, the second idea is that innovations result from entrepreneurial activities motivated by the prospect of innovation rents. And the third idea is creative destruction. New innovations make old technologies uh, become obsolete, displace old technologies. And you see right away that at the heart of the growth process, you have a contradiction. On the one hand, you, you need those temporary monopoly rents to motivate uh, innovation. Right? You, in fact, that when you innovate, you get rents at least for a while until you are superseded or imitated. Uh, and that's what the prospect of these rents motivate the innov you know, uh, innovation investment. But on the other hand, those rents can be used, exposed to, pre by, uh, to prevent subsequent innovator innovation. Because yesterday's innovators who, who got rents through innovation, of course, they, they worry themselves about being victims of creative destruction. And they will do all what they can to prevent uh, being themselves uh, you know, subject to creative destruction by new innovators. And they will use the rents that they got from innovating. And so regulating capitalism is managed, it's all about managing this contradiction. On the one hand, you need to have rents for innovation. And on the other hand, there is the, of course, the big you know, danger that those rents would be used, exposed by yesterday's innovator to prevent subsequent innovation. The Schumpeter himself was deeply pessimistic, pessimistic about the future of capitalism. He thought that you know, the first innovators would turn into uh, entrenched conglomerates that would successfully block any subsequent innovation. In this book, we are more Gramscian optimists. We think they are uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, instruments, they are levers that can be activated and uh, which will, uh, you know, which will uh, avert the pessimistic prediction that Schumpeter had about capitalism. Okay? So instead of being pessimistic, we are Gramscian optimists. I mean, so it's an optimism of the will. It's an optimism of fighting. It's not a kind of a passive optimism. So the book, what it does is to use the lens of creative destruction and of the uh, Schumpeterian framework I just outlaid to do three main things. First, to revisit some main enigma in economic history. Second, to question some common wisdom. And three, to rethink the future of capitalism. So let me just uh, start with some enigma. The first enigma is the takeoff. Uh, uh, we know uh, from the work of, uh, in particular, from the work of Madison, that uh, if you look at worldwide growth, of per capita GDP, essentially not much happens until 1820 with the industrial takeoff in the UK and then you know France and then US. And so uh, growth as we know it now is, is a very recent phenomenon. It's 200 years old, it's three times my age, which means uh, that I'm old, but means that you know, it's still very recent. Why did it happen in Europe in 1820, not in China in uh, 1000 when they had many inventions already in China? China is a country that invented the wheel, the compass, many, many inventions were made in China. Uh, and why not in China long before 1820? And there, you see the, the Schumpeterian paradigm uh, 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 helps you understand what happened. And that's what we do in chapter two of the book. And it's very much the work of Joel Mokir. Joel Mokir tells you that by, uh, you know, by the, the 1800 in Europe, you had institutions that would uh, in, uh, permit cumulative innovation. In particular, you had universities, and you had the Encyclopedia that would codify knowledge, the Encyclopedia Britannica in, in, the, in England and the uh, Encyclopedia de Diderot in France that would codify knowledge and made it easier for new potential innovators to build upon previous knowledge. So that those institutions existed mostly in Europe. The second thing, so the kind of openness that you need. Huh? The second thing is that you had institutions in England with the Glorious Revolution and then in and France with the French Revolution which followed by Napoleon that would, uh, uh, you know, that would lead to uh, setting up property right protection. You needed to protect property right on innovation. It was very important to make sure that uh, pro pro potential innovators would not be expropriated. And uh, the glorious revolution in England or the French revolution led 
to uh, you know, this protection of, of property rights. So that was very important, and that happened in Europe. And the third thing is creative destruction. In China, whenever you would have a successful inventor, he or she would be uh, you know, somehow inhibited by the emperor because the emperor was afraid that the, that innovator would become too powerful and would threaten his power. Uh, in Europe, if you would persecute a researcher and innovator in, in, a, in, a, in France, for example, the innovator could always flee to Switzerland, to England, to Prussia, uh, and develop his innovation or her innovation in those countries. And those countries would compete with France. So it's the competition between countries in Europe that allowed creative destruction to be sustained. And you see, so in Europe, you had the condition for those three key elements to be fulfilled. You see, you could have cumulative innovation, property right protection, and creative destruction taking place truly thanks to the competition between European countries. So you see already how one enigma very much can be enlightened by the, uh, paradig the Schupeterian paradigm. Another enigma is the secular stagnation. So we know that, you know, if you look at TFT growth, average yearly TFT growth in the US, uh, we look at three periods here. We know that it went up between 95, 2005. That was the IT revolution. But then since 2005, uh, growth has gone down in, you have a growth decline in the US. And you want to understand why do you have this growth decline despite uh, the fact that the IT revolution has spread further and despite the fact that you have, you know, now the uh, artificial intelligence revolution. How can you explain that? And so that we talk about that in chapter six of the book. And we explain that particularly what's very interesting is uh, this up and down of growth, uh, this boost, this surge, this growth surge uh, followed by a growth decline is particularly true in the IT producing sectors, which is the black curve, and the IT using sectors, which is the gray curve. It has to do with IT. And what the, the story is that, in fact, during the IT revolution, uh, uh, and, and uh, you had the, you know, the, the emergence of superstar firms. And these superstar firms became prominent. Uh, uh, and at first, uh, you know, is the uh, Amazon, Walmart, uh, Microsoft, Google, uh, those guys. Or they first, they, they, through mergers and acquisition, they became pervasive. They uh, invaded most sectors of the US economy because they were very productive firms. At first, it boosted growth. That's why you have the boost of growth. But then once they spread everywhere, they inhibited innovations by non-superstar firms. And you can see that the entry of new firms, uh, the rate of entry of new firms declined starting in the early 2000s. You see? So, so the problem there is that you see, you had, uh, 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 it's, a, it's really the Schumpeterian dilemma. You had the emergence of big firms that turned into conglomerates, and then they inhibited innovation by other firms. And in fact, what happened in, uh, in, uh, in the US, but it's also true in other countries, is that competition policy did not adapt to the digital era. We allowed those firms to do merger and acquisition as much as they wanted without worrying about the consequences that such mergers and acquisition would have on uh, uh, subsequent growth and entry, subsequent innovation and entry. And uh, uh, you see the difference between, uh, you know, on the one hand, Schumpeter or Robert Gordon and us is that, uh, you know, is that Robert Gordon would say, well, there is nothing you can do about the decline. Schumpeter would say, there is nothing you can do about these conglomerates. And we say, no, there is something you could do is to reform competition policy in the US. And the Biden administration, in fact, undertook to change competition policy in the US. You see? So that's, uh, uh, that's what. Uh, and uh, hopefully, the hope is that this change in competition policy would lead, uh, would somehow, uh, you know, counteract this tendency to growth decline. So that's where we are, you know, Gramscian optimist instead of being uh, a pessimist, you see? Another enigma is the middle income trap. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but you see, it's the, it's the dilemma that some countries started to grow very fast to catch up with most advanced countries, uh, like, for example, Korea. South Korea grew very fast between 1945 and the late 80s, and then grew, Korea slowed down. But you have other countries like Japan, which is an advanced country, which started to grow fast and then slowed down. And uh, why is that? And we explain in chapter seven what happened is that during the catching up period, during the catching up period, uh, 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 big conglomerates uh, developed in those countries. So in, uh, in Korea, you call them the Chobols. Uh, in, in Japan, you call them the Kiritsus. And those conglomerates, not only they prevented entry of new firms, but they also put pressure on governments to, to not move towards institutions that would favor frontier innovation. You see, those countries were, had institutions that were adapted to the needs of a catching up economy, but not so much to the need 
of a frontier innovator. And we know that for, from chapter four of the book and chapter seven, that frontier innovation requires in particular more competition, uh, more entry, uh, uh, more openness, uh, more flexible labor markets. And uh, in fact, those conglomerates, because they were concerned about competition, not only they prevented entry, but they also prevented governments from, from uh, uh, reforming their institutions in order to become uh, really frontier innovators, in particular, to reform their competition policies. And uh, 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 very interestingly, Korea, the crisis that Korea went through in the late 90s, weakened the power of the Chobols and then made it possible to uh, move towards uh, you know, more competition, more openness, and also more entry in, in the sectors that were previously dominated by those conglomerates. So that's the middle income trap. Uh, uh, the next one is the source and dynamics of inequality. So there, uh, you see what we show is that, you know, there are several sources of uh, top income inequality. See, top income inequality is the share of income owned by the top 1% or the top 0.1%. But you have other measures of inequality. You have uh, uh, the Gini, which is a global measure of inequality, which is how far you are from perfect equality. That's another measure of inequality. And then you have a third measure of inequality, which is more dynamic, which is the correlation between parental income and children's income. That's a dynamic measure of inequality. And what's very interesting is that innovation is a source of top income inequality. Why? Because when you innovate, you get rents from innovation. Mr. Skype became rich because he invented Skype. Mr. Steve Jobs became rich because he invented Apple. Okay, so that's a source of top income inequality. And you can see here, that's based on work with uh, Richard Blondel, uh, but Antonin uh, Bergeau and David Emus in the River Economic Studies. We rank states in the US by the, in their intensity of innovation, states years. And we see that as, as US state becomes more innovative in terms of patent production, and the, the flow of patents in the state, uh, we see that the uh, top income inequality, which is the continuous curve, goes up. So you see that more innovation means more of a higher fraction of income to the top to the top one percent. But on the other hand, what's very interesting is that innovation does not affect the Gini. You see, it affects the top income inequality, but not the global measure of inequality. That that's very interesting because uh, uh, the reason is that it's true that innovation. Uh, induces more innovation, uh, uh, inequality at the top. But on the other hand, it also increases social mobility. And it decreases social mobility because innovation is associated with creative destruction. Creative destruction is a replacement of existing uh, uh, you know, interests by new uh, uh, interests. You see what I mean? So that's a source of social mobility. You replace the old by the new. And, uh, uh, and, and, and particularly innovation by entrance, we show in this um, same paper with Blondel and other co-authors, that more entrant innovation, particularly, is associated with more social mobility. You see, so, so innovation, it's, it's a source of top income inequality, but which also increases social mobility. And that's why overall, innovation does not increase global inequality. So it's a good source of top income inequality. In contrast with uh, uh, lobbying, lobbying is another source, and entry barriers are another source of top income inequality. But they reduce growth because they prevent entry. They reduce social mobility because they prevent entry. And as a result, lobbying not only increases top income inequality, but lobbying intensity increases global inequality. So you have the good source of inequality, which is innovation, the bad source, which is lobbying and entry barriers. So I always, we say in the, in, the, in the book, you should not confound Steve Jobs and Carlos Slim. Carlos Slim is a rich Mexican. He became rich because he's at the head of the unregulated telecom monopoly in Mexico. He's not the same story as Steve Jobs, who became rich because he invented Apple. Okay, so that's our view with inequality. Now, on the other hand, no matter whether the, you get rich because of innovation or you get rich because you have a lobbying, no matter, you could use this wealth to prevent subsequent innovation. So you still need to have policies that would prevent you from doing that. Or taxation policy is one, but competition policy is another instrument. And uh, competition policy is, is as important as tax policy to make sure that the rich do not use their wealth to prevent subsequent innovation. So I have no problem with people become rich, particularly if they become rich because they innovate. But I don't want them to use their wealth to uh, prevent other people from, you know, under, you know uh, trying things, innovating, and, and things. That's, uh, that's my own view. That's our own view on innovation and inequality. Okay, are you... Uh, uh, are you, the, are you with me or am I too fast or is it still okay, uh, Ariana? Can you follow? All good, Professor, yes. 
It's all good. Okay. Great. So now I said the second thing we do in the book is to use the Schumpeterian paradigm to question common wisdom. So one common wisdom is taxing robots protects employment. No, it's not true. In, in recent work with uh, uh, Céline Antonin Simon Bunal, who are the co authors of the book, and Xavier Jaravel, we show that French firms that automate, they create employment. Why do they create employment? It's true that machines, to some extent, substitute uh, for labor, okay? But, uh, uh, but you see, the thing is that the, when they do that, they become more productive. When they become more productive, their export price go down. Therefore, their sales go up and their market share worldwide go up. And therefore, there is more demand for their product and therefore more employment. So if you tax the robots, you would prevent those firms from becoming more productive. And therefore, you would prevent them from hiring more. So you see, you have to be very careful that you see, in fact, the productivity effect of automation, in fact, more than counteracts the direct substitution effect. Another common wisdom is that protectionism, that we explained that in chapter three of the book. Another uh, uh, common wisdom, and the inequality, by the way, is chapter five, I forgot to say before. Uh, uh, protectionism is the way to regain control of value chains. No, that we discuss in chapter 13. If you look, for example, in COVID products, COVID products I, 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 I refer to is uh, masks, tests, and, uh, and respirators that was before the vaccine. So we did this study before the vaccine and we compared Germany and France, imports and exports. Imports, so the black curves are Germany, the gray curves are France, the triangles are, uh, are exports, the circles are imports. You see that Germany is a little bit better, but not much better than France in 2002. But you see that nowadays, Germany is way above France, and it, it, only, it not only exports more of these products, but it imports more of these products. So Germany didn't wage a trade war. Germany just innovated and invested. In fact, now Germany has a, a surplus of 20 billion euros on these products, masks, tests, and respirators, whereas France has no surplus at all. Because Germany innovated, France did not innovate, you see. So, and in fact, if you look at uh, how close to the technological frontier France is in terms of innovation in medical technologies and pharmaceuticals, the dotted line here is the frontier in terms of the number of the flow of triadic patents. Triadic patents is patents that are registered in the US patent office, Japanese patent office, and European patent office. They are the good patents. And you see that France was very close to the frontier in 95 in those te uh, technological, medical technologies and pharmaceutical products. And now you see we went away from the frontier. So France lost in terms of uh, you know, world trade and uh, uh, because France uh, gave up on innovation. So innovation is key. The key to regain control of value chains is to innovate more. If you try the trade war instead, a trade war, the destination country will retaliate. They will close export markets to you. And we explain in the chapter that when when uh, export countries destination close export markets to you, uh, uh, that reduces your own incentive to innovate, and therefore you innovate less, and therefore you are less capable to regain control of value chains. You, you shoot yourself in the feet by waging a trade war. It's much more promising uh, uh, to to bet on innovation in order to regain control of value chains. Okay, so that's the that's the this one. Uh, <clears throat> less common wisdom is that negative growth would be the way to stop climate change. Or it's true, historically, temperature has gone up when the Industrial Revolution went up. Here I have temperature. And you see the curve for temperature is very much similar to the curve that I had uh, you know, when I showed you the uh, industrial takeoff of growth. Uh, uh, it's true, historically, temperature went up when growth went up, when growth took off. That's the true world, and that's the counterfactual. What would have been uh, if, uh, if the Industrial Revolution had not occurred? Uh, uh, now, does it mean that you should, and that's for China and, and India, uh, uh, the CO2 emission by China and India took off when growth in China and India took off? That's for sure. But should we infer from that that the solution to the, the cl climate change is to have negative growth? Well, you know, we had an experience of negative growth. We had the first lockdown uh, in France, for example, between March 2020 and June 2020. GDP went down by 35% and CO2 emissions went down by 8%. So it would mean that we would be permanently in the first lockdown. We had to do the first lockdown. We didn't have the vaccine at the time, but we know all the psychological effect this had uh, uh, on the French population, particularly uh, the young generation. They very much suffered from the first lockdown. We had to do it, but how could we propose to be permanently in a first lockdown? So the only other way is to have green innovation. 
But the problem is that innovation is not green spontaneously. Firms that, tend, that innovated in the past in dirty technologies tend to innovate in the future in dirty technologies. You keep doing what you are good at. We call that past dependence. We discuss that in chapter nine of the book. And, uh, and, and therefore, first, that means that creative destruction helps you because new firms do not face the path dependence. They didn't exist yesterday. They don't have this problem of path dependence because they are new. So already there, you see that creative destruction is a solution to the, to, the, to the green innovation problem, okay? And also the state can use, uh, the state can use you know, carbon tax or industrial policy uh, subsidies to green innovation to redirect uh, the technical change of existing firms from dirty technologies to green technology. So that's, that's so the state can play a role. But then I get closer to Wendy and some, and some balls with the triangle, the civil society also can play a big role uh, in uh, redirecting technical change towards green technology. For example, in recent work with Roland Benabou, which we devote a section of the book to, we show how consumers, you know, by the name and shame, the consumers can redirect firms' uh, 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 innovation towards green technology. Of course, all the more when there is more competition, because of course, if I'm the only producer and, and, and consumers have no choice but purchasing from me, even if I am not a green producer, they have no choice. They have to produce from me. But if there is competition with Wendy, Wendy is a virtuous producer, even if I was not, you know, uh, intrinsically uh, virtuous, because I compete with Wendy, I am forced to become virtuous. Otherwise, I lose all my customers to Wendy. So the, the, this combination of, you know, uh, motivated, uh, of, of, you know, of virtuous consumers, huh, of uh, uh, so social values, if you want, with competition, in fact, amounts to an increase in carbon price by 17%, and uh, which means three times what triggered the Yellow Vest movement in France. So it's a very powerful force, civil society. You see, and here I just give the example of consumers and, and, uh, and the competition mechanism with the consumers pushing. Uh, um, so that's the chapter nine of the book. Okay, so the, the, now the third thing that the book, so I, I just discussed some common wisdoms, okay? Uh, taxi robot, bad idea. Uh, protectionism, bad idea. Negative growth to fight climate change, not a good idea. Do, uh, green growth with the state and civil society uh, pushing for the green growth, okay? For redirecting technical change towards green innovation. So now I get to the last part of the book. And the last part of the book is about uh, using this framework to rethink capitalism. So give me one minute to get some water. So in fact, the problem, what the, what the crisis revealed is a broken social model in the US. But it revealed also an uh, inadequate uh, innovation ecosystem in Europe. So first, if you look in the US, we talk about that in the conclusion. If you look, you know, as a result of COVID, many people lost their job in the US. And that's the rate of unemployed in the US, which is the triangle curve. But we know that in the US, when you lose your job, it increases the probability that you lose health insurance. So that's the fraction of US citizens without health insurance. It went up, whereas it had gone down with Obamacare. You see, that's the miracle of Obamacare. It really worked, Obamacare. It reduced the fraction of US citizens without health insurance. But it increased again with COVID at the time where they needed health insurance. If I compare to Germany, in Germany, everybody had health insurance throughout. And I could have put France, uh, Scandinavian countries, I think even the UK is better social protection than the US. Now, similarly, when you lose your job in your US, you are likely to fall into poverty. That's the poverty rate, this curve. It increased uh, in Germany, uh, in the US with, uh, uh, with COVID, whereas the, the poverty rate in Germany remains uh, constant throughout the COVID. So in that sense, you know, the social model ensures better against uh, shocks like the COVID in, uh, you know, uh, in our European countries than in the US. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to innovating, the US are much better. Here I show the number of biotech patents uh, uh, the, in 2016 per million inhabitants is much higher in the US than the average EU27 or the average OECD. And if I, and if I instead of showing the number of patents, I show the, you know, the triadic patents or the top cited patents, the, the, the gap between US and the rest of the world is even much bigger, okay? So they are much better at innovating. Why are they much better at innovating? And that we explain in chapter 12 of the book, is because they have a fantastic ecosystem of innovation in the US. For basic research, they have very well-funded universities. They have the National Science Foundation. 
in biotech, they have the National Institute of Health and they have the Howard Hughes uh, 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 Medical Investigator, which is the private foundation to finance uh, basic research. Uh, and they have other private foundations to finance basic research in the US, particularly in biotech. So already only for basic research, they have much more than Europe. Then you go into venture capital. When you want to go from basic research to setting up, to start a new, to, to create a new startup, you need venture capital, much more developed in the US. Uh, uh, when you are a bigger firm and you need to finance uh, risky activities, then, uh, uh, institutional investors are very important, much more developed in the US than in continental Europe. And then you have the BARDA and the DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. That was an agency created in the US in the 1950s when they were racing with the Soviet Union. It's where the basic research has been done, but you need to achieve a mission within two, three years. Like for example, putting a man in space or achieving, you know, uh, 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 you know winning the war on, a, you know, on, on, you know, on, on certain type of weapon. You want certain types of weapon to be operational within two, three years. So and the basic research has been done, but you need to coordinate resources and actors to go from the basic research stage to the uh, industrial production quickly. Uh, uh, the DARPA well, uh, did it. And the DARPA, uh, it's very interesting governance. The money comes from the government. They had team leaders. And the team leaders are free, have freedom to elicit uh, competing projects, public private partnership. So you have a top down part and a bottom up part. And it's a very original way to do industrial policy, which is pro competition. And that it was experimented first in the US with the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. Then subsequently in the US, they created the ARPA Energy for energy. And then they created the BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, uh, you know, except AstraZeneca, all the vaccines we use, uh, be it Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson, all have been at some point financed by BARDA. And BARDA is exactly the same structure as DARPA, but for biotech. And you see BARDA on a uh, vaccine, on things related to COVID, mainly vaccine. They spent $12 billion last year, uh, where Europe uh, on overall, uh, uh, and it was not through a BARDA type of, 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 uh, of you know, institution, they spent $4 billion only. So you see the ecosystem of innovation is better in the US, but the social model is better in Europe. So now to conclude, the capitalism I would like is a, is a capitalism that combines the good side of the American model to be innovative with the good side of the European model to be protective and inclusive. Some people believe, like my colleagues Asemo Glu, uh, uh, Verdier, Robinson, that if you choose to be more innovating, it has to be at the expense of being protective and inclusive. Or if you choose to be protective and inclusive, it has to be at the expense of innovation. I think this is not right. I think there are at least three kinds of policies that would make you both more innovative and more protective and inclusive. Let me talk about those three policies. The first policy is flex security. The second one is education. The third one is competition. Let me talk about them in turn. Flex security. In the US, we talk about that in chapter 11 of the book. We, we mentioned the work of Anne Case and Angus Deaton. They talk about the death of despair. It's this curve, continuous curve. The mortality of the, uh, uh, you know, the age, the unskilled uh, uh, people aged between 50, 54, why not, why not Hispanics? Uh, in the US increased sharply since the 2000s. Why? Because when you lose your job in the US, <clears throat> we already saw that you, with some probability you lose health insurance, you, your family is dislocated, you lose status, and uh, your life becomes hell. And people, you know, are so, anxiety and stress is so high that they resort to opioids, uh, antidepressants, uh, 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 sleeping pills. Uh, they, they start eating pizzas all the time and become obese. You see, and that's why you have this uh, death of despair uh, rising so, so fast. So you don't have the equivalent in Europe. Uh, uh, in, the, in Denmark, and that's the work of Alexandra Roulet, and all that uh, we talk about in chapter 11 of the book, we say, well, uh, Alexandra, she compares the health of a worker whose uh, factory or whose enterprise closes uh, with an identical worker in an enterprise that doesn't close. And so it's a diff and diff, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, specification. And, uh, and you see that there is no effect, the difference between the worker in the plant that closes and the uh, worker that the plant that doesn't close, you see no difference after time zero where the, pl the plant of the former worker closes. 
So here we look at the annual probability to purchase antidepressants, anti-anxiety, or sleeping pills. Uh, the worker in the plant that closes, uh, uh, compared with identical worker in a plant that doesn't close down, uh, 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 you see you see no difference, uh, absolutely no change in the purchase of antidepressants, anti-anxiety, or sleeping pills. No difference in the probability to visit hospital for a circulatory uh, disease and mortality the same way. So that's, uh, uh, and what's great is that you see, they did that, they achieved that in Denmark, because in Denmark, when you lose your job for up to three, four years, you get 90% of your salary up to $600 a week. Huh? Not, uh, for example, very high salaries, you don't get 90%, but you are reimbursed 90% of your salary. You are retrained and the state helps you find a new job. They propose you at least two jobs in your qualification. If you refuse more than two jobs, uh, uh, you lose your part of your insurance. But it's a system that works well because it makes creative destruction be very efficient. So that makes that made the, the Danish economy more innovative. But at the same time, uh, uh, it makes it's a very protective model. You can see it. So you see, you can be both more innovative and more protective. I think flex security is a very smart way to achieve to do both to achieve both at the same time. Now, I want to talk about education briefly, and that's chapter 10 of the book. We look here at the, at the relationship between parental income in the horizontal axis and the probability of inventing. And uh, the left-hand side uh, graph, uh, the left-hand graph is, uh, is the US current data. The middle graph is US historical data. And the right-hand side is the Finnish, is Finland uh, current data. So you see that when you have parents in the top income bracket, you are much more likely to innovate. Uh, in the US, it's not very surprising because the tuitions are so expensive. In Finland, it's more surprising because education is free and very high quality. So that was an enigma for us. And why is that also true in Finland? Because parents who are, who are more in Finland are also more educated parents. So it's not so much that it's the money they give their children. It's the education and aspirations that they transmit to their children. And uh, uh, if you control for parental education, you see the curve, which is this J curve, the blue curve becomes the red curve. So it's much less, it's much less of a J curve when you control for, uh, parent, uh, for parental education. It's really the fact that uh, uh, you know, higher uh, income uh, parents are also more educated parents. Uh, 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 so uh, it was an enigma for us in, in, in Finland, but in fact, it's because the, the, the system they have now in Finland, which is free and high quality, is in fact very recent. It's been set up in the 70s. So if you restrict attention to uh, inventors that went through the system after 1970 in Finland, there you would see that parental income has no effect essentially. It's only for those who went to school prior to the reform in Finland. You see, that's the thing. But that's what tells you this overall. We have in our country many lost Einsteins, uh, as my colleagues call it, uh, my colleagues Van Rinen, Jaravel, uh, Chetty et al. Uh, uh, there are many lost Einsteins. I mean, there are many smart children, but they were unlucky. They, they were not born to families where the parents could, uh, you know, could transmit uh, uh, education, knowledge, and aspiration. And as a result, they won't become inventors. Now, suppose you have the Finnish system for many generations. In that case, uh, uh, you will have much less lost Einstein. So you make the economy more innovative, but also more inclusive because many more people can innovate. So that's another policy that makes you both you both more innovative and more inclusive. Uh, 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 finally, competition. I told you before that the US, you had the growth decline uh, since the mid 2000s, and it was due to the fact that entry went down, that the big superstar firm, uh, you know, uh, uh, stalled uh, entry, uh, discouraged entry by non superstar firms. So the way there, suppose now that you have competition policy, suppose that the Biden reforms on competition work well, what will happen then? You will have more entry. So that will boost growth, of course. It will be good for innovation because uh, it will boost innovation. But at the same time, we know that entrant innovation is good for social mobility. I mentioned that before, and we see that in chapter five of the book. So by boosting uh, competition there, you will both boost uh, innovation-led growth, but at the same time, you will also boost social mobility. So here again is a policy that will make you both more innovative and more inclusive. So at the end of the day, I want to get there, the triangle. Now let's see about the triangle. Uh, remember that Schumpeter was concerned that yesterday's innovators would uh, turn into conglomerates that would discourage future innovators, okay? Uh, 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 that's a true problem. One way out 
if the state, the state can have, for example, competition policy. Uh, 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 that's one thing that the state could do, or rules to finance political campaigns, to limit the, uh, you know, the, the extent of lobbying and to prevent, to limit the extent to which uh, incumbent firms would uh, uh, discourage new entry. So the state has tools to do that. The problem is that the state can be bought, bought, out, uh, uh, bought out by the, by the firm. Uh, and we saw that when we discussed a middle income trap, we saw that in fact in Korea or in Japan, the big conglomerates, they buy out the government, okay? So there you could say, well, but you know, the state is not just the executive power, it's the judiciary power, the judiciary uh, uh, control the executive, okay? The problem is that uh, uh, the constitutions are incomplete contracts. That's my work that I've done with Bolton uh, uh, and, uh, and, Alice, and Alice Dina and Treby, where we show that constitutions are incomplete contracts. So uh, because they're incomplete contracts, there are no guarantee that the constitution would be enforced. And in fact, that's where the triangle is crucial, is that the civil society plays a crucial role as a means of ensuring the effective implementation of the contract. In particular, suppose you have the state with a competition policy to make sure that uh, yesterday's innovator will not prevent subsequent innovation. Well, if the state doesn't want to do it because the state, because uh, the executive power would be, you know, corrupted by the firms, well, civil society is there to limit the extent that civil society is the media, is the unions, is the associations, is the voters uh, that will prevent that. You see, uh, 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 it's also the voters that voted Biden in the US. You see that civil society uh, that, and that now you have the new competition rules in the US. So that's a very important, and as you see the triangle working there, I mentioned already, the, that, that's why it's very powerful. You see, for example, uh, Colombia has the same constitution as France, but in Colombia, when you are a union leader, you are likely to be killed, not in France. Why? Because see, there is much more civil society in France than in Colombia. You, you, you have the same constitution, but it's, and an example of that is, of, of, the, of the triangle that I give always, is the fight for civil rights in the US. You have the civil war, uh, uh, you know, in the late, uh, mid, late 19th century. The civil war leads, uh, you, the fact that the North wins over the South, uh, uh, means that it's the end of slavery. And uh, you have the 15th Amendment in the US Constitution granting voting rights to the African Americans. But as you know, the Southern states circumvented this amendment because they introduced literacy tests that, the, of course, the African Americans could never pass. And so de facto, they could never vote. And it took the civil rights movement to, you know, uh, until in 1964, one century later, only one century, it took one century for this amendment to become effective. Thanks to the civil rights movement, you had the voting act of the Supreme Court in 1964 that pre precluded, that prevented, that forbade this literacy test and made it possible for African-Americans in the South to indeed vote. So I think that's a, that's a key uh, uh, thing uh, that this, uh, you know, uh, triangle is key not, not, uh, to making, to, uh, to averting the pessimistic prediction of Schumpeter, to achieving green growth, to achieving more inclusive growth. You see, but that's really the, the way, because the constitutions, the state could of course do the job, but the constitutions are incomplete contracts. And that's where you need civil society to make sure that the incomplete uh, social contract is enforced. That's my own interpretation. But the idea that, you know, you have contractual incompleteness and you need the civil society because you have to circumvent the contrary completeness. Is this idea to be completely, is entirely, uh, 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 you know, to uh, Sam and, and Wendy? And what we did here is to show that this idea is so powerful that you can get into, uh, you know, you can link it to, uh, uh, you can link it to the, the creative destruction uh, paradigm and show how, in fact, the triangle is the response to Schumpeter's pessimism, and uh, uh, and that's where and, and that's where uh, that's that's where we. That's, that's where we are, the fighting optimism is, voila. And, uh, voila, and that's, the, the, that's the outline of the book. And I think I should stop there. Thank you, thank you very much. So Wendy, was I okay? Uh, yes, please time okay? have, Professor. Have I, have I, uh, uh, have I uh, betrayed your, uh, your approach? No, no, no. I think it, it, you, you displayed the, uh, the usefulness of this uh, this this way of kind of putting together the the essential role of innovation in the private sector. So that's the that's the market uh, um, uh, pole of the of the triangle. Um, the crucial role of the state to enforce uh, entry 
and um, permit the social mobility through the mechanisms that, that you suggested. But the, the kind of standard debate, which just goes along between more market or more state, more market, more state, sort of left, right politics is, is, is not good economics. And um, what we have to do is to put in the third pole. Um, and I think your illustration of that in two very different ways um, was, was very effective in, um, in highlighting why we can have an optimistic perspective if we include the, the, the power that derives through the democratic process um, to, to complete uh, the constitution, that incomplete contract, but also through uh, uh, the importance of, of social preferences in exerting uh, pressure on firms to, that results in directed innovation and the demonstration of that, of the importance of that for green innovation, I think uh, is very powerful in the work that you've done. You see, we, 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 we learn a lot from each other, but at least I learn a lot from Wendy. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, it's very, so it's, uh, you're, you're right, no, that's. Uh... Alors, of course, the enigma we have is China. Professor? China is an enigma for us. Because do they have a triangle? Pro Professor, um, I, th I think we lost Ariana, but would you have time for one question? I have one time, but only one question. One I'm question. Sorry for that, one only. No worries. With huge um, apologies. We'll, we'll take Ansha's question, um, who asks, if protectionist policies prevent exports from entering the country, can domestic firms be incentivized to innovate to capture rents? I don't understand what the question is. Um, Ansh, if you, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? If you are protectionist, you, you induce retaliation. You understand? If I set a high tariff, the destination country will, will, will uh, retaliate. But if they retaliate, they make it harder for my firms to export. But if, I, if, I, if they close export markets to my domestic firm, my domestic firms have less incentive to innovate because their rents from innovation are, are reduced since their markets are reduced. Um, yeah, thank That's you. That's why you, you shoot yourself in the feet. Hmm? Thank you for the clarification. My question was if, if you don't have imports com coming from different countries because of protectionist policies in place, won't uh, domestic oh, firms have the opportunity to innovate now because now they don't have to compete with cheaper products coming from abroad? Yeah, but on the other hand, you see imports is a good uh, 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 competition from imports stimulates innovation because we explain in chapter four of the book that you have what we call the escape competition effect. So when you have more competition, you innovate to escape the competition. So that's an, a, a, a further incentive. So it's not, you should not fear imports. And the way to, uh, to re, again, innovation is the best way to escape competition from including from importers. Philippe, what about the problem if you're just too weak to innovate? Alors, if you are too weak, uh, that I talk about frontier countries, okay, like the US was, no? So, uh, alors, now if you are weak, alors, do, is there a case for, you know, infant industry or something like this? You, there might be, but the problem with the, if you have such policy is the, is the problem that you can never stop it, you see? So, you may want a priori to do it. The problem is that you may fall into the middle income trap syndrome that once started, this policy would never be stopped because you would, you would have some, you know, uh, rising, you know, some growing conglomerates that would say, let's never move away from it. And there you have a trade-off. Should I start with infant industry? If I know that with some probability, I may not be, never be able to stop it. And that there is a true debate there. Oh la la, you want to talk a little bit about China? And it's Tian Yi Yan, of course. You tell us about China because I know it's, a, it's an enigma for me. I believe that China, because I believe freedom, and we explain that in chapter 10 of the book, freedom is an important part. You need freedom to, to innovate. But China managed to innovate a lot. Uh, now, I don't know if they are really frontier innovators. That I don't know yet. And to which extent they manage well also because they co author with people in the US. They cater to freedom elsewhere. So I don't know. That's something I'm, I'm trying to research about. So what is the, tr the problem? Tell me. You want to speak? Hello, I saw the discussion. Tiani, you want to tell us? 
Ah, market is weak. Uh -huh. That's why it works. Well, uh -huh. I think I uh -huh. think it's a big question uh -huh. there. Yeah, I understand what you sure. write. Okay. So, Professor, yes. can you hear me? Yes. So, uh... but I have to go in two minutes. So uh, I think I think we should have a debate on that. I think it's a hard question. So, uh, so yes. I, I think that uh, two parts of the triangles they are uh, they are too small, but it's not the triangle does not exist. Yeah. I think the in the triangle uh, the civil societies and the markets they are uh, still weak uh, at this point. I see. Uh, especially. I think the civil societies they yeah. cannot um, they cannot um, uh, how to say uh, they cannot pre uh, prevent uh, a very powerful state or government uh, from uh, using its power. Yeah, but that's my question. Can you, uh, I have to go I, I think that's yeah. a yeah, but I think the problem is, traditional... yeah, yeah, but the question is, how did they manage to already innovate so much in China, in despite what you say? You see? Alors now, what kind of innovation are those? You see, how does uh, uh, is China, despite what you say, managing to be you know, to innovate, or is it really not frontier innovation? Is it more like adaptation or imitation or? Uh, oh, do, do they manage to do frontier innovation despite the weaknesses that you mentioned? You see, and state back, I see the state back innovation, but can innovation, how much can it be state back? You see, I, I talk about DARPA and BARDA, but BARDA, BARDA, DARPA and BARDA was building on basic research, which was very much free. And then they go into DARPA BARDA. So that's, uh, 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 you see, is that enough quoi, to generate sustained frontier innovation? Well, that's the kind of question. That's the kind of debate I have. It could be that now they are on the DARPA model, and that brings them already. That gives them a lot already. But uh, 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 can you do? Can you really become frontier innovator uh, in some areas where you have missions? Uh, DARPA can help. Uh, 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 that's what you call the strategic industries, which is very much like the DARPA ball uh, 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 activities. And you say that beyond the DARPA ball activities, that not much can happen. And that could be the, the thing: is that essentially. They, are, they follow DARPA model, quoi. and for that part, they could manage to innovate, but not for the rest. I have to go now. Uh, uh, I'm sorry for that. I would have loved to continue the, the, the conversation. Yes, Professor, thank you so much for exciting. taking the extra very time. Exciting. Very exciting. Thank you very much, both from yeah. the Economic and, Society and, and the UCL wonderful Department. Ariana, and, and wonderful to see uh, Wendy and, to, uh, and uh, to, uh, to interact with you all, and uh, it was very very instructive for me, very uh, enriching. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Carlin, bye bye. for the introduction and for the great questions, bye bye. everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, Philippe. Bye. Thanks so much, Wendy, for so much. Thanks so much for so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.